Are we ready? Uh, yeah, we're, we're starting. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. And, uh, um, well, go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. I'm so glad to see um, so many of you here. And um, really looking forward to sharing a little bit of info, but also letting you ask questions so that we can make clarifications, reduce the stress and all of the craziness that happens around college admissions. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Shallon Anton. I've been a college counselor since 2012. So I'm, I'm going on year 11 here. Um, previously, I was an English teacher, um, high school English teacher, and also did one year of ESL. Um, what I love about college counseling, and I've, I've served as director of college counseling in two different private schools, one in Maryland and one in North Carolina. And just in the past year, I've gone fully just working independently with students, which I love. Um, and um, what I love about what I do is my frustration with this process that it's become so complicated and uh, it's difficult to, to sort of weed through the information to know what's really important for your student to know what to do. And I like helping translate that and helping students and families' lives be less stressful, less hours at the kitchen table being about applying to college and more hours being about being a great um, high school student, spending time with family and friends and um, gaining skills that are going to make them flexible and able to be successful when they do get to college and beyond. Um, I'm going to share screen with you um, to just review, since this um, evening is supposed to be about, whoops, um, all about, and let me get this to, it's supposed to be a, oh, there we go. I don't know, we'll start it over. Um, about sophomore year um, of just sort of the greatest hits of what 10th graders need to be doing to stay on track. And I wanna preface this with every 10th grader is different. Every 10th grader's path is going to be different. And so sometimes timelines are a little more flexible. So this is a general one for the majority of students that are planning on being college bound. Um, the most important thing is the transcript. And this is how a student performs in the context of the high school they attend. So when people say GPA, um, I prefer to, to, to use the term transcript um, because GPA at one school is not the same thing as GPA at another. Um, the, the high school that one student might be going to and have you know, a 4.1 GPA might be among the strongest at one school and be middle of the pack at another. And it all depends on that school's grading system. How many AP or international baccalaureate classes do they have? how they're weighting that. And so a lot of colleges are gonna recalculate anyway. So more thinking about what courses are available at the high school where that student attends and what grades, what, what, what courses are they selecting and then what grades they're making. And I think that letter grades um, in a more general sense is, is a better way to think about that. Um, and so, you know, some parents will say, well, he has a 4.0 weighted GPA. And it's like, well, but that's not all A's. And so depending on um, how that works, and you all know this from where your schools are. So what did your student choose to take, how they perform in those classes? And then um, I, I asked them to repeat or to complete again, um, strengths and interest exercises. These are things that are everything from, some of you may have done Myers-Briggs personality test, um, things that help you figure out what are you naturally good at and what are you interested in that might help lead to a major and even a career? And I like students to keep repeating this each year in high school because their brains are still developing. They're still changing. They're gaining so many experiences that um, can help them become more of who they're going to be. And so every year kind of revisiting is a great idea. Um, as far as extracurricular activities, seeing where can they get a little deeper involved in some of the things that they're already doing? Can they take a little initiative, maybe even leadership opportunities, um, or just showing that they're, they're, deep, they're, they're really committed to that activity? If they don't have a thing that's really driving them and, and that they're excited about, it's still early enough in sophomore year to try something new, to, to push themselves out of their comfort zone and maybe discover something that they like better. Um, I love to see students 
doing things that they enjoy doing, because those are the ones where students are gonna get more deeply involved and have meaningful involvement that's gonna go, look good on a college application. You know, I've seen it so many times with kids that are very calculated about what they're doing, but it's maybe not real of how interested they are. And another kid that just does what they feel like and they end up having a more remarkable list of activities to share with colleges. So really encourage you to allow your students to um, choose how they spend their time outside of classes um, so that they can turn anything into a bigger um, project. In addition, um, making a plan for summer, they, they don't have to, every student doesn't have to do a, a highly competitive academic program. And to, to, to tell you the truth, my students who have gotten into the most selective schools in the country often have not done one of those. It's just a um, it can be great, but if that's what they want to do, but something that aligns with their values, what they're interested in and their strengths, so that it's meaningful to them. And they're more likely to have the ability to write about that on their college applications in a meaningful way and talk about what they learned this summer, what they gained, um, how it changed them for the better, what were they shocked by, what was humbling. Those are the kinds of um, experiences that make the best um, of those. And um, that can be a summer job, perfectly acceptable. And I can tell you that some of my favorite college essays have often been about um, what they learned working the drive through window or um, dealing with the public or picking on responsibility that was more than they thought they could handle, but in the end they could. Or um, it can be volunteering, it can be organized things. And I've had students create their own projects, do their own research project um, themselves, um, or a service project that they create themselves and they recruit some friends and neighbors to get involved and make it go better. Um, in addition, if you weren't on the call already, Dan Dan has some amazing trip opportunities for students, um, both to the North Pole and um, to the um, Arctic Circle that are re amazing, remarkable experiences that kids could both see a lot of the world and um, gain academic skill in research. Um, so let's see. In addition, the big testing thing, SAT, ACT. So here's the good news. No sophomore right now, if they haven't thought about either of these tests, they're not behind at all. And I know that in um, high achieving areas, if you live in, a, in an area of the country or the world where it's extremely competitive, there are kids who get started super early on this sometimes. It isn't necessary. Sometimes it can be great if there's an amazingly natural strong test taker that they can get it out of the way, but most students are gonna need to keep testing all the way up until application time in the fall of senior year. And what you don't want is your student to get so sick of getting up on Saturday morning and going to take these tests that they're like, I'm not doing it anymore. And if you haven't been around a teenager um, a lot lately with that attitude, know that that attitude can show up. Um, if they're being wonderful and agreeable right now, they often just get tired of this process. And um, so late in sophomore year is a great time. And this can be over the summer um, easily as well. But to figure out, are they better at the SAT or the ACT? These entrance exams for the colleges that still um, take them, whether they're test optional or not, as long as they're not test free, like the University of California system, then they don't care if you take the SAT or ACT, they just want the highest score. And so in, what I love doing, I said about being efficient, about helping families spend less time on this, I, I hate to see a student who does prep for both tests and sits for both tests four times. Um, that is not, that is proven to not have a higher end score than if you figure out before, am I better at one or the other? And, um, and then any formal prep, if you're using a tutor or taking a course, um, any official sittings where you show up and officially take the test are only taken on either the ACT or the SAT, depending on which they're stronger at. It's very hard to predict how a student is going, what, which one will be stronger. I'm constantly surprised. Um, you know, SAT is 50% math, where ACT is only 25% math. However, ACT is faster. And so you often end up with um, 
a student that you think is a super fast worker, but they also happen to be strongest in math. And you, you never know how that's going to go. And so trying out both is the best way to do it. And at the end of 10th grade is the best time um, to figure that out. Um, and then you, you can, you know, rest assured that you're not wasting time on a test score that you're never going to use. Um, starting to get into the habit of checking their email regularly. And I think kids got better at it with COVID time. And I am noticing with my own students that they're getting away from it. But there are chances of opportunities that could come up. And it's also a really good life skill. I know every January I do a big unsubscribe exercise to try to clean up my email and quit just deleting on my phone all of the spam that I'm getting. So to learn to manage that. In addition, if they've still got an email address that they made up in sixth grade and it says something like, you know, goofy Jimmy at Gmail, um, sometimes it's, it's far worse than that and inappropriate, but um, having them create a new Gmail with just their name um, and numbers or something to set that apart and using that only for college stuff is a really great plan um, so that if they're exchanging emails with admissions reps, they seem like they've got it all together. Um, and it also can be just this email that they reserve just for that. So they're not going to, you know, go online shopping and get the spam coming in. Um, attending a college fair, sophomore and junior year, great time for this when they really don't know what colleges they're um, going to be competitive for, or interested in. There is a massive college fair that would come to major cities every single year, NACAC, which is the National Association College Admission Counseling. I have been where there are more than 500 colleges and you know a, a conference center, um, and there are admission reps standing at those tables dying to talk to your, your students. And great opportunity to look in the eye and shake the hand of an admissions rep from a school that perhaps in another couple of years would be the exact person who's reading a student's application. It's a great way to get a taste of a lot of colleges um, and also make that connection. Colleges um, like when students demonstrate that they're very interested in attending there and having that interaction, they, you go and you get a, um, a QR code on your registration, they scan that for you and they'll start sending you um, emails and putting you on lists, letting you know perhaps about special events that might um, occur in your area. Also visiting campuses um, in general, start now with maybe a couple that are local to you. You know, you probably live within 45 minutes of at least one great college and maybe even more. And um, even if it's one that your students thinking, I'm never gonna be interested in that, learning what a college campus is like, seeing things on that campus that they probably maybe won't apply to if it's close by, but that they have something that's like, okay, I wanna find a school that has that but I want it to be really far away from mom and dad. Sometimes that's the case, um, but whichever it is. Also, if you are traveling, absolutely use that opportunity since you've already paid for the travel to get a place to do a tour or, um, or two close to where you're vacationing. Um, this is an easy and excellent way um, to see more campuses and get an idea of just how different they all are. Um, great idea for them to visit both small schools and large schools, wonderful pluses to all of those things. And they just might surprise you um, and say, you know what, I feel that. Reading, have them, have them read as much as possible. Reading books, fiction, um, nonfiction, whatever. This is gonna help on their SAT and ACT test, but also when they're, they're improve their writing and their expansion of the world. My last thing that I kind of put in, in this yellow orange at the bottom is the intangibles that aren't, you can't check off, but working on skills, time management, academic study skills, navigating relationships. And that includes friends, teachers, and um, family, learning how to interact appropriately with teachers in, in the school. This is such a, an important factor that will help them get better teacher recommendations help them learn to navigate how they um, communicate with professors once they're on campus. And, um, and also like, what if something's not going well? How do I approach that and talk with that, that teacher? In addition to navigating, um, perhaps strife with friends. Um, this is definitely a time when parents should not get involved in that. Parents can talk through 
a conflict with their kid and maybe say, have you thought about this? But the students, you know, moms and dads should not be calling other moms and dads to say that someone's not behaving well. And that goes for calling teachers. Let your student um, navigate that first. Um, health and wellness, self-care. I talk to all of my students about how much sleep are you getting every night? Are you physically moving and exercising regularly? And um, are you eating well? And are you taking time for social interaction? And I think that we've gotten to a point where um, in, in high achieving areas, these kids are really stressed out and often they won't be exercising and keeping their body healthy. They're eating junk. Um, they're so stressed that they're creating, you know, relationship problems between peers. Um, and they aren't, they're staying up half the night because they've signed up for way too many AP classes. This is not a recipe for a student to be in good shape for making good grades, um, learning, um, being ready to show up on a college campus in a couple of years and handle themselves. And so helping them figure that out and, um, you know, that they need at least eight hours of sleep at this age and some, some even more. And figuring out the balance of what courses you can take and still sleep a, a normal amount. I understand exams come up and if it's once or twice a semester where they're staying up super late, that's one thing. But if they're doing so many activities and taking such hard courses, um, this is not a recipe for success. Um, and independence, so don't do for them what they can do for themselves. This is the communication with the adults in their lives, um, with teachers, et cetera. Um, if they're the type to pack lunch for school, they can do that themselves. Occasionally, mom and dad get doing a favor and doing a little extra for them is great, but I promise you they can do their own laundry. They can take care of their own space and keep their rooms neat. Um, I, I cracked up one time in a, a presentation to students in one of my schools where I was talking about like, you know, you're about to go to a place where your mama doesn't work and you're gonna need to, to do these things like make your own lunches, help with meals at home, and maybe even volunteer to cook dinner once or twice a week for the whole family, um, you know, all of these things. And there's some of the kids in the room where their eyes get big going, me, do laundry. And then there's always inevitably a kid or two who comes from a big family with a lot of, of kids. And they say, I've been doing all of that since I was seven because my mom had these other kids younger than me. And um, they're like, this isn't hard, guys, pull it together. So um, I want to encourage you to think um, of these, all of these things and consider your child as this whole person and not just um, someone that's going to be applying to college and has to be perfect. Um, I, I've been working you know, with high school students for a really long time now. And the ones who are most successful are the ones taking charge of their own things the most. They're also the ones um, who are managing things and not over committing to do absolutely everything. And um, that's, I guess that's my, my two cents for that. And I'll stop there and open it up to questions. Wow, this is great. Thank you, Ms. Anton. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So any question from the floor? So I will start, okay? So kind of the okay. ice breaking. Um, often um, parents want college counselor want us to set a goal um, as early as uh, freshman or sophomore and uh, because they want the kids to work toward the goal. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, if you set a goal a little bit too lofty like MIT and um, many kids will get disappointed toward the end. Um, I I have similar incidents at home. Uh, it's not like I was setting the goal for my kid for MIT. My brother went to MIT and the kid went to MIT a few times. So he was always thinking about MIT and he didn't, you know, he got rejected. So, so this whole thing, um, yeah. So how to balance the parents would say, hey, you set a goal and, and, and you know, so, my, yeah. Yes, that's such an excellent um, question and point to bring up. And it's, um, parents will come in and say my kids made straight A's through you know kindergarten through middle school and they enter ninth grade shooting for schools with single digit admit rates just since I entered this field a decade ago admit rate rates have plummeted at so many schools and when you get down to an admit rate of four percent 
Um, I liked when I'm talking with students and families, I often what I say is their reject rate is 96%. And you've got to figure that that 96%, you know, at least half of those are highly qualified and could be very successful at any college. Um, and that's probably understating what percentage. And so how do you get to be picked? And often that 4% also includes recruited athletes. So you're, you're taking as much as a quarter of a class, depending on the size of the school, sometimes half, um, who are, are taking up those spaces in that admit rate because they're recruited athletes or their legacies, so they have that extra, or a special artistic talent, like they play the bassoon and all of the bassoon players in the school symphony are graduating this year. And so they hit the jackpot on the right instrument on the right ear, um, as well as major donors, people who are building a library and putting the kid's last name on it. Those things, unfortunately, um, count as well. And so, Counting on that is difficult. And by the way, when I, a million years ago, was finished in high school here in the US, Harvard was admitting something like 40% of um, applicants. I, I should have applied, um, <laughs> didn't taunt on me, but it's, it's just amazing. It's such a different animal. And even as I've been working in schools and working with siblings where I work with one student and then their younger sister five years later and the admit rate has dropped in half at the school where their sister went and that it makes it so much more difficult so that's my reality thing about admit rates the other thing is you're coming out of middle school oh my kid's been a straight a since since kindergarten um, and that's great they haven't had one ap class they haven't done one demanding extracurricular like an athletic team or something where they've got five day a week practices plus a weekend situation. Um, they haven't had to take charge of any of the extracurriculars that they've been in. And so as these things sort of snowball, how that, um, what that, the rigor of the school, um, the, the courses that they take, often that child doesn't stick with being a perfectly straight A plus student. And that's totally okay for humans to, you know, perfection is never reached. So we shouldn't sh say that we're going to be perfect. In addition, um, test scores and whatnot. And while and we can prob we'll probably get a question later about test scores and while yes, most of the colleges in the country are test optional now, that still means that um, many schools love some high test scores and high test scores can be a differentiator and can help a student stand out in a way that can still be important. So, you know, um, if you've got, if, you're, if your child does show up and keep making straight A's through high school, but they don't come in with SAT or ACT scores that are in line with how high they are in the class, well, that's another thing that we can't, you can't know in ninth grade for 99% of the students. Do I meet kids who take a PSAT in ninth grade and make a, you know, a 1580 SAT um, that early? Occasionally, but it's very rare. And depending on what math they've had, they've got to finish pre-calculus, um, but also their language skills. And are, if they're an avid reader all their whole lives, that can help. But if they haven't, they've got to build up on that and they may need test prep. And so predicting in ninth grade where any student on the planet has a good chance of being admitted is a futile effort. Um, we have to see, okay, how does ninth grade go with maybe a couple of honors classes? And then how does 10th grade go with a few APs? How does 11th grade go with even more? Are they still competitive for those schools um, that you know, you're setting? In addition, and by the way, 11th grade is when the heaviest point of APs often gets piled on. Um, also the heaviest extracurricular situation where they're moving into a position of leadership and have a lot bigger commitment and time crunch becomes extremely difficult. They're often taking driver's ed and you know have a job or babysitting or whatever going on as well. And so maintaining those grades when basically responsibilities probably about double between 10th and 11th grade for most high achieving students becomes difficult to maintain that level of performance. Um, in addition, um, as a parent, um, and I, by, I have two daughters, they're 20 and 22. So it wasn't all that long ago that I was sitting with, with a 10th grader. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons and made a lot of mistakes. And I'm grateful for what I do because I think I made less of them trying not to, but when I was in the throes of it, I was a parent 
thinking the same way um, at times. But when we, when we tell a kid in ninth grade, you know, like I only want you, you know, MIT is the school for you, only Stanford, with our, which are such impossible for, for a kid without one of those hooks that I mentioned of athletics, legacy, um, major donor or special artistic talent. If, if, if you're just an ama- if you're just the valedictorian even, um, and those, your chance is not necessarily that 4% admit rate. It's probably more like half a percent. And depending on where you're coming from, what region of the country you're in, um, which high school and things like that can make that on, on more on the half a percent side versus the 1%. When they get to 12th grade and they apply to these schools or when they get to 10th grade and they really mess up in chemistry and, and you know have to retake it or whatever those things are, when they fall short of this sort of almost impossible expectation, um, it, they feel like they failed us as parents and um, feel like they're, and I can assure you, even, even the most laid back of parents who aren't saying anything, they feel our pressure. That isn't to say that we shouldn't set high expectations for them, but our expectations should be more about behavior and about skill development and about effort and um, interest and engagement and being a good person and being kind um, and thinking about their classmates in addition to themselves and all of those things, I think um, is a better way to realign it. That isn't to say I have students every year that get into highly selective schools and go on and do really well at those schools. And it is possible and it does happen but when 50% of the class is pretty sure they're getting into Stanford at any given high school, that's never gonna happen. Um, there are going to be a few who make it um, depending on the size of the class. You know, we were, I used to work in really small private schools, so there was no way we were getting five into Stanford when there were only 50 kids in the class every year. Um, but, um, but, but, we, but they do and it's possible, but it's never, I've never seen a student be successful at that because of high pressure and being told in third grade that you will be going to this school. It's they become who they are by us empowering them and encouraging them. Um, and if that's what they land, great, but it might not be the right school for them either. And there might be a better fit place that's going to help them thrive at the age of 22 when they're finishing undergrad or set them up for the next step of graduate school. Anyway, I could talk on this topic for, for decades, but I'll stop with my lecture for now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This mm-hmm. is great. This is great. Yeah. So I do have another follow up, uh, follow up question and about uh, this highly impact project. And the parents coming in, they expect us, say, oh, well, the grades are good. Can you design something for us? Like that project, that nonprofit would take them to a very selective school. Do you have any comments on that? Sure. Um, so it has to be authentic. Um, and, and when I say, what I define authentic is the student really cares about it. Um, and part of what I do when I'm working with students as early as ninth grade is do values exercises to help them get to know themselves and think about what matters most to them um, so that when they make choices, for their free time, which is outside of those seven hours, they're locked into the school building. So this is summers, this is nights, this is weekends. When they have free time, how they choose to spend their time ideally aligns with a value that's important to them. And I have them identify top 10 values and I repeat it with them every year because it changes a little bit. You know, they get exposed to more. They find out about a social issue that really makes them mad. Um, They find out about an academic subject, a little niche. uh, spot within and something that they love and they get deeper into that you know kid thinks that they they like physics and then they get deeper into astronomy or any of those sorts of things um, and and so these projects have to be authentic we absolutely do help them if with with coming up with ideas of things to go but it, I make sure it aligns with their interests their values and their strengths for instance I'll have a student who really cares about the environment but they hate math and science. And so they're saying, I'm gonna start a project to you know, um, physically go out and do these things, or I'm, I wanna get an internship in of environmental science. And it's like, well, hold on just a minute. You're really good at writing and communicating. Um, maybe we should do something that's more about advocacy for the environment as opposed to actual science. 
So that's what I mean, that, that's sort of aligning with strengths, but sticking with their values. So we definitely help with that. Um, I can tell you that I have had students, if any of you are parents of, of my current students, I, I might have told you this story at some point in a, in a call, but one of my students who went to Cornell um, had no extracurriculars ever at our school. She was the quietest, mousiest little student. Um, and um, really, you know, she, she lived a life of the mind in the world of science. And um, what she did was her whole life, she went hiking in the woods behind her house and collected things from plants to animal sk snake skins, even bones of animals that had passed away in the woods. And she would bring them back to her back patio and Google and identify what they were and catalog them and kept spreadsheets and, and made display cases. And, you know, and this was like from the earliest of ages and she really had kept going with it and had her own research projects going on by high school. All of this she created on her own. It involved no one else. Um, it wasn't official leadership. It wasn't any of that. And yet an Ivy League school said, yes, we want this young woman. Um, and she's in a doctoral program now. Um, she's, you know, those things are great. And um, I've had students who, um, Creates create their own research. Just uh, one of one student was on cephalopods, you know, um, uh, octopus and whatnot. If you don't know what that means, and he, you know, started contacting professors probably in middle school to just learn more, and they really provided him with you know great things to to dig into, and eventually involved him in in things. But that was a relationship that the kids started building up from early ages. Um, I have had students be very traditional. Um, sort of all sorts of, of, of the typical type of things that we think of also be very successful. What's important, a lot of my students come to me and they're trying to get the Presidential Volunteer Service Award, you know, the, the 100 hours or whatever that requirement is. Colleges are much less interested in I racked up hours than you could have done half the amount of hours, but in something that you got deeply involved in and it's clearly meaningful to you. Absolutely, positively, a hundred percent. This is true. Um, you know, uh, if a if a high school sophomore gets a hundred hours, but it's ten hours in ten different places, it's not doing. I it's much better to pick one of those that they maybe are most interested in and like the most, and go deeply into that. Does that answer that, Dan? Dan? Yes. Yes. Very okay. well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think. Hey guys, you guys need to ask some questions. <laughs> no questions at all. I can cover other topics if if they want to hear more about other things, testing, etc. I can certainly cover other things. You can put it in the chat, by the way, if yeah, you'd rather definitely. not ask it, but but chat a question, please do. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, I'm Mrs. Mom. So like for my kids, he has nothing special, but of course he has his own like strength. But if we want to apply for like a like dream school, so how could we, I mean, um, do that? So like a <laughs> test GPA is not good. <laughs> if your if I can if, if your GPA is not so good, I'm assuming when you say dream schools, you're talking about the, you know, top 20 schools in the country that are close to impossible to get into. Is that what you mean when you say dream school? Um, yeah, not top 10, like uh, between top 20, top 30, okay. or about a little bit above top, top 20. Um, if, if, if he doesn't have a strong transcript, um, then it's likely not going to happen. Um, yeah. And in addition, yeah. let me add, if, if, if academics isn't like, the hugest focus so that they absolutely love, then maybe some of those schools might not be the best fit for them in the first place um, because they can be incredibly intense um, and incredibly demanding and competitive. And he might thrive better at a school that kind of um, embraces a more well-rounded lifestyle in college where playing an intramural sport or getting involved in a band or um, service activities, you know, whatever their, their enjoyment is, um, that it, it might be best to think about other schools. And there's 
3,600 four-year schools in this country, and a whole lot of them are really great and offer rather remarkable experiences um, to the students who attend there. So I, you know, what I, I when I talk about values, I, want, I, I would challenge parents as well to think about like, what is it about those schools that I'm thinking is the keys to the universe? When um, I, I encourage you to think about fit for in each student because um, they are who they are. And yes, they can mature, particularly boys. Often that they, I love that the US, University of California system does, they carve ninth grade grades out of GPA when they recalculate and look at those things because they recognize that ninth graders and particularly ninth grade boys, uh, they haven't gotten the memo yet on all of that. So, um, uh, you know, and also a lot of boys come into their own kind of as they're leaving for college and understand that graduate school um, where many are going to be heading is a great, you know, they, they can go to graduate schools from just about anywhere and maybe sort of strengthening their, um, strengthening their academic skill at a school that maybe isn't so intense and competitive when they arrive might be a way for them to be a stronger applicant for graduate school, particularly when it's a grad program where they need to be at the top of their class. Um, I, I see a couple in the chats um, and then I see a hand raised and we'll get to that one, but best time to start college counseling. Um, I personally, I'll do a consult call with someone at the end of eighth grade, but I don't work um, regularly with kids before high school. Um, I think that's stress inducing and they're just too young for the most part. If they're, they wanna talk at the end of eighth grade kind of about like what to take in ninth grade and sometimes selecting between multiple school options, fine. Ninth grade is a great time, but again, it depends on the kid. I, um, I think that um, I like, when, I, I like when, when ninth grade can start, but I'm not talking to ninth graders every single week because they would despise me by the time it was time to, to do college applications, but I also don't think it's too early for the focus to be on that. Focus needs to be on being a great high school student in every way and checking in periodically, giving advice, answering questions truthfully and accurately is probably the, um, the, the way to think about that. I work with students starting some, some, I have ninth grade students, 10th, some don't come to me until um, late in junior year, or even start of senior year, if I still have space. That is, I can help with the applications, um, but often what I see when a student comes to me late um, is they have spent three years um, running in 20 directions when I wish that they had come to me sooner so that I could help them focus their efforts. Colleges aren't looking for well-rounded students. Highly selective schools aren't looking for kids who check every box, that they're an athlete and an artist and um, running all of those things. They're looking for students who have gone deeply into just a couple of areas. They have involvement broadly, but that um, they have deeply developed their skills and their interest in specific places. And so I'll have a student who has, you know, gotten the 100 hours every year of service, but at all different places, um, who's um, thinks that they're supposed to play a, a sport somehow and also be an artist, even though they're not necessarily creative. And I wish that they would have um, had, you know, uh, some more guidance because I think they would have a more effective application. Um, so it depends, it depends on the kid, super strong students who have a shot at those dream schools earlier is definitely better and, but, but not before high school. Um, how to motivate kids if they don't wanna take the help such as a tutor and a consultant. That is an excellent um, question. And I've worked with students like that. Um, I've won over some students like that when they begin that way. And you know, I have a call with them just to say hello and they don't wanna do it. And then a few weeks later, sometimes we have a second call and, um, uh, you know, that I, I think it isn't that they don't want to work with a tutor or a consultant or whatever it is. It's often that they're afraid. Um, they're afraid it's going to add stress to their life. They're afraid that they're going to be embarrassed because they're falling short. Um, and if you're working with someone who's, who is doing those things with a student, well, 
that's not the right person and they're not the right fit for working with that student. You want to find someone who is motivating and encouraging them, um, but also who's showing them that they've got power um, and ability, like a good tutor. And, and you know, I was a English teacher before this, but with whatever the subject is, a good one is um, revealing to the student that they've got the power in their hands and they just build upon those, those skills. And um, so sometimes it's finding the right fit. And I know over the years I've had students get like SAT tutors and it's not a good fit. And they, they're not connecting whether it's how that tutor is um, explaining the concepts or the tutor stressing them out and saying things like, if you don't get your scores up, you're never gonna get into a good college. It's not true at all. Um, so, so finding the right fit and if something's not working, it's okay to make a change. Um, for them. Motivating. Um, I, the, the other thing is teenagers and they're their own little brand of, um, of independence. And so if, if putting it back in their seat saying, okay, so you're not doing so great in chemistry. What do you think the solution is? Like, and hold them to it um, and say, okay, I'll, I'll give you that for three weeks or a month or until the next test. And then if it isn't, there, then we're going to get you a tutor. That's the kind, I, I think um, giving them the chance to take charge of it is, is always um, a good place to start on that. Um, so, and I see, I think the same person who had asked that question has her hand raised too. Is it Min Ying? Um, yeah. Did... Yeah, it's me. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm ask uh, the question about how to motivate the kids yeah <laughs> okay okay yeah so um how about teresa you have your hand up oh yes okay. thanks yeah mm -hmm. if my kid is not great on academic i'm talking about her gpa for instance is less than uh 4.34 you know, majority like to, to go to accept it by the good school or above 4.4 .4, or some as like a 4.8. But how about if my kid is good at SAT take, take her, she is, if uh, she got almost a perfect score for SAT, for instance, do you think there is still a possibility for her to go to the- Okay, um, so yeah. first, first of all, um, GPA in the 10th grade and GPA at the point of applying to college after three years, you know, after at three years of, of um, completion on a transcript, typically GPA start right, if, if the student does well and takes a lot of APs in 11th grade, then that weighting takes, so if you're hearing that students from your school who get into a certain college that your daughter's interested <laughs> in, um, and by the way, the GPA that you're telling me at any school, she, she is not a weak student, first of all. Um, that to, above a 4.0 average, she's she's a capable student, um, and and even even some students below that. So um, I, I don't want you to you know think that. But if you're hearing a lot of students, my the parents that come to me with ninth and tenth grade students, and they're like, oh, they're not high enough. Well, often the the acceleration of that GPA and rising happens in, through eleventh grade because you might be taking three three APs in tenth, and then suddenly you take six and eleventh, you're doubling. And so that um, higher GPA often happens by the end of 11th grade. Um, high test scores are good. Transcript almost always is more important. Um, high test scores with moderate transcripts, like a pretty good, can get very good um, scholarships at some schools, um, at many like flagship public universities um, in, um, states in, in lots of places and it's not it used to be like oh it's the southern states or oh it's this but it's really a, um, a wide range and so that that's something that can work really well if you're saying oh we can get free college um, is a possibility and, and test scores are kind of what they pay for more than just um, grades on those um, so it would depend and I would have to see like a full understanding to be before I can weigh in on any specific student mm -hmm. I would need to understand what school see what they're taking and see kind of what trajectory they're on before. But yes, and I'll tell you, you know, um, it, the funny thing over the years is often I'm surprised, like my students with the completely pristine transcripts of all A pluses and the super high scores and everything looks in order, 
mm -hmm. aren't always the ones that get selected. And sometimes it's the students where, you know, a third of the transcript is Bs and, um, but they've done something really interesting or and, and write about it in a really authentic and interesting way. So it's, um, it, it, it's hard to predict. Um, and that's sort of where, like getting back with and Dan's thing initially of how do we, you know, have set those dream schools early. It's um, it's like you know how are you how are you going to jump and be able to reach the second story window in your house? You know, like it, if it's not going to happen unless you're you know seven foot ten maybe and do a mm -hmm. lot of uh, work at the gym for a while. But there's natural things that we can't know um, too much. Mm -hmm. um, and then I see AO11. Oh, oh Teresa, one more you, question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I heard earlier you said you are also uh, do the private counseling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. uh, I uh, uh, I can also uh, find your information from the yes from Dan Dan. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, Dan perfect. Dan um, can can connect you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Teresa, okay. you can add me. Yeah, I can give you my question. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. What about we have AO eleven? Yeah, um, that, that's me. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, so my question is about a teacher relationship. Uh, from what my daughter uh, told me, uh, she doesn't have a, uh, any interaction outside of a class with the uh, teachers. So you know, I'm I don't know how American high school uh, works. So other than a uh, class uh, interactions inside a class with teachers. What other opportunities can my daughter to engage with teachers? Okay, that's such a good question. Um, so occasionally that a teacher, you, you have a teacher for a class and they happen to be the sponsor for a club that you get involved in, you know, that your physics teachers takes charge of robotics or a coach or something that they end up, occasionally that happens, but it's, it's unusual. Mostly um, what she needs to do, and, and, I, and this is something that I coach my students on and constantly am asking is, you know, are you participating in class? How you perform, you know, the grades that you make are very important, but what makes a teacher recommendation really good is that extra special sauce that you, that if, if you weren't in the classroom, how would the dynamic of that classroom change? And, um, are you participating? Are you contributing? Are you supporting your classmates? Are you a friendly voice? Are you a challenging voice? And sometimes it's a feisty kid in a political science class and they're arguing, but they're, they're you know, elevating the discussion in the room. But it's all, everything that needs to happen to get a good teacher rec can be done within the classroom. And, you know, there are subjects that lend it better, you know, the, the humanities courses where there's a lot of discussion and whatnot, of course, um, allows for participation in another way, but you can certainly be in a mathematics class, in a science class, and it's, you know, what, what character are you showing and how are you interacting um, with it? Are you asking good questions? Are you a person who never speaks and you only show up, turn in the work, you might be getting straight A's, but you never ask a question and um, you never uh, take the initiative. And it, it, asking a question doesn't have to be because you don't understand something. It can be a what if, you know, taking and showing a teacher that in a science class or a mathematics class, like that your brain is thinking of different scenarios and considerations of like, okay, well, what about, what, what happens to that theory when, um, if this changed? And, you know, showing that your brain is, is working that way is great. And that's academic, social of how you're interacting, being a good member of that classroom community is, is the bottom line. And I, I'm serious when I tell you most students don't hang out with teachers in other way, like it, the opportunity typically is not there in the average American high school. Um, one th another thing, by the way, so, you know, I was, a, I was an English teacher and I wrote a lot of teacher recs before I was a college counselor, but I also spent a lot of time in the teacher's lounge and been, being around teachers. And, um, Proactive communication, and this is for if someone's struggling in the class, whatever, um, talking with teachers at the first sign of trouble, letting them know that you care, that you're worried about your grade, that you don't understand something, 
Um, it is the number one way to get to know your teacher, to get them to think good things about you. And also, you know, if things are going poorly, if you're not communicating, they think you have that your head in the sand. So um, it's a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of students that, you know, they're embarrassed that they're not doing well in the class. Um, but I assure you that is the, the best thing. And at the end of the semester, if they're at that sort of like, you know, the 89.4, they're a lot more likely to get the benefit of the doubt and get nudged over to make the A than if they haven't been communicating um, and making that teacher know that, you know, they're making every effort. And occasionally those teachers will be like, hey, come eat lunch with me and give them a little extra tutoring, giving them their time, or do you have time to come after school one day this week? Or, hey, here's some, here's a great YouTube resource, you know, to point them in the right direction. In previous years, when I have students struggling with this particular unit, if they go on crash course for this, they usually get it, you know, it's a different way. So um, it's, it's such, such an important part of high school. And, it, and it, the same thing goes in college, you know, if, if they're going to a large research university, if they want to get research, they've got to compete against graduate students and um, building relationships with your teachers is um, a great way to do that. Um, so I see some more questions. Let me look at the chat again. Um, so one of them was, which test should I pick, SAT or ACT, if the kid's not so good at math? It's hard to say. Um, you know, in theory, it would be ACT because it's only a quarter math, but it's also 30 seconds shorter per question. So you've got to work a lot quicker. Um, it all, you know, it can depend. So taking those baseline tests, and what I, I like students at the end of 10th grade to take a practice test of both under timed conditions. That's the most important factor in there that they, they time it and they sit down on a Saturday morning just like they would be doing later um, to be able uh, to, to go straight through for that full test that's almost four hours. Um, and that way they can tell like, okay, without prep, what is my brain working best at? Um, and you know, I, I, you never know. It's, you never know quite how that's gonna go. Um, my own daughter, was not a, a fast worker and so we definitely didn't but as it turned out um the style of the questions for the act was better for her and with just a little bit of practice of getting the timing down she was able to do like the equivalent was about 300 points higher than what her sat score would have been so um doing those two practice baseline tests before you've done prep in either test is um, the best way to go. I do recommend familiarizing themselves with the test. If they've taken the PSAT, that's enough to know how it works. Um, ACT, they need to know, they don't wanna waste any time figuring out um, the instructions for each section. So just understanding how each style of section works before they do the practice test. Um, so would you suggest a 10th grader do a summer program at a university and how important is that for a college application? So every answer to college counseling questions starts with, it depends. And is the 10th grader really highly interested in a particular um, subject where they're excited about a summer program that they found and they're like, oh, this is so cool. This, this program, they're offering computational biology this summer, which, you know, I didn't even know what that was 10 years ago. I didn't know what the, until I was in college counseling, I didn't know what that was. I now know it's really, really important. Um, but they might find something if they're driven and really genuinely and authentically interested in that program. Absolutely. If they're only doing it because they think it's going to look good on an application, not so much. And um, I would say less than half of my students do an official summer academic program at um, a university. And um, it's sort of equal numbers of those who get into selective schools versus not. So um, best like to find what you love um, and figure out how to spend your time. The important thing is you can't play video games all summer. You've got to, you've got to engage and do things that are important. Um, and so, but, but a very good question. And again, driven by the student. And I see we have a hand up from Shu. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, the chemistry is challenge in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. So my daughter right now is eighth grade. So in order to prepare, 
you know, for that class. Do you have some suggestion? Maybe in the summertime, and uh, she can take some thing to prepare. I um, I think that what's important is that she keep developing academic skill, and that's doing well in the classes that she's in. She doesn't necessarily um, have to do a chemistry prep program, and I. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that unless she was like really loving chemistry and wanting to get into it. Um, I have, um, you know, students who they're just thinking STEM um, and, but chemistry might not be what's in their future and STEM. And then there's kids that are super good at math and they haven't considered until sort of late in high school or even sometimes in college that business uses an awful lot of math and that that's a great place to put your math skills. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do any specific prep directly to, um, to a, a particular subject in, in high school, unless your, your school is telling you that um, a student, your middle school is saying that they're really deficient in one particular place. So for instance, I have students who maybe um, English isn't their native language. They can really use some extra ESL. That's, that's a great thing to do before high school if they're still struggling um, academically with English. Um, and so, you know, great thing, way to spend your time. But I would not, I don't think that's the, the best use of her time. And if she's a good student already, who's doing pretty well, she's probably gonna be absolutely fine. So, um, I you know think that that's that that's kind of the, the best way to think about that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a um, I'm going to go to one. There's a hand up, but I'm going to go go to one on the chat. When I pick classes, should I think about my future? Sure, I mean definitely. Um, but you also should think about your present and your sanity, and um, think about just how much um, uh, like there's only 24 hours in the day and you need to spend about a third of those sleeping. And you also need to spend, you know, at least a half hour of that maybe moving your body and um, ideally connecting with another human in some way, in a, in a non-stressful way. And so then you're in school for seven hours and you've got so many left. I've had students who come to me, you know, where I, when I was working in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, we were, you know, 20 minutes to Duke and UNC Chapel Hill. Duke is in that world of schools of not predictable um, for admissions. You know, you can be the valedictorian, it's not gonna work. The valedictorian at my school was always gonna get into UNC unless they had like a disciplinary problem um, at the school. And so, but we knew the formula at my school of just how many APs it took, how many you had to take, and what grades you needed to make in those, et cetera. And so sometimes students would come to me going, all I wanna do is to go to UNC Chapel Hill. And I would say, okay, let's look at it. And I would tell them, You're, you gotta take one more AP next year and make an A in it. Um, one more than they were already registered for, for instance. And they would say, I don't know if I should do that because with what I already have on my plate, I'm going to have four hours of homework minimum every night. And with what else I do, and I have a job because I have to pay for my gas and my car insurance. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, so what do you think you can handle? You know, and there's often this sort of moment of really can I? And almost always, if the student knows that's going to be too much, they make the right choice by not doing it. And sometimes they perform so well that it, it, tips them over and they're able, they might get on the wait list and then get at the school that they want. So thinking about future is, is important, but, but thinking about present is also, and I, I don't have to tell anybody that, you know, mental health crises with teenagers in the world right now is sort of an epidemic. Um, and we don't want stress to turn into depression or anxiety to the point that they aren't able to pass you know, their, their classes. And every single year in my schools, we had students who were tippy top of their class on this huge trajectory. And then somewhere in junior year, they just completely um, collapse on it because of that. So take care of yourself. Make sure that you're considering all of those things. Um, okay, I'll go to Bo. 
Oh, hi. Um, thank you for all this information. It's really helpful. So I don't have a high school student yet, but I'm trying to get myself prepared since I didn't go to high school here. I don't know anything about high school here. Mm -hmm. um, so I heard a lot. I think I, I have a couple of questions. The first one is about AP classes. I kind of hear different um, advice from uh, or the what do it? What do we say? Otherwise, from the AP classes, some people say, oh, AP classes are not that important when you apply to college. And some people say, oh, it's really important. You should take it, something like that, right? Then how important is it to take AP classes? That's what the first question. That, it, it's a great question, OK. Yeah. And the second question is about the clubs and uh, some athletic programs. So I know that the academic is the foundation of um, for college application. Uh, but I, I also heard that um, some, some students, their academic is not that good, but they did get um, admission from like those really good schools. And because of, because of them attending all those programs and the clubs, so yeah. Then my question is how important and what's the weight okay. of the, those clubs and, and the programs? So then, but those are I have great. another one. You have another one. OK. <laughs> yeah. So my third one is the, about a counselor. I think like for myself, I don't have experience here, so but I still want to help my kids. Um, maybe one way I can help them is to have a counselor like you to help them to make a plan for for uh, four years of uh, high school. Then let's say if we start, let's say the counselor start work with my kids starting from the first year, like there are four years you can work with her. How would you start to work with her? Are you going to make a plan or meet with her frequently? How often are you going to meet yeah. with okay. her? Yeah, these are all great questions. Um, let me let me start with a so by the way with all of these with clubs that the, the ap the importance of ap's the importance of clubs and athletics i'll start with it depends um and the importance of ap courses so the school where i worked um in maryland had ditched ap classes about 20 years ago um the teachers the veteran teachers this was a private school 130 year old private school who had never changed their curriculum until they added some AP courses in the 90s. And the veteran teachers, and there was one teacher there who had been um, there since 1969, and this was like early 2000s. Um, he just retired like last year. Um, he, we, he jokes that he came with the building because they got a new building in 1969, but um, they revolted against the AP courses and said, um, we don't like this curriculum it's too um too strict and we don't have time to get into really fascinating things because we have to teach to this test in may and so the school agreed to it and ditched them all and this was early 2000s when you know um college admissions was still child's play compared to what it is right now um and they they didn't make that decision based on college admissions but all, what it, the effect of it particularly 10 years later when things started getting crazy in admissions was that it improved college admissions because if no one can take an AP class, if honors is all that's there, then they're taking the most rigorous curriculum available to them. And by the way, just my own side note, my my the the um, the students at that school were attending every year. We had students going to Ivy League schools, to Georgia Tech, um, you name it. You know that were going to incredibly difficult academic programs. Um, whether it was humanities focused or STEM focused and making Dean's List and being the tutor on their hall freshman year and um, excelling and then going on to remarkable grad programs, et cetera, with zero AP classes. Um, and so we have kind of bought this curriculum hook, line and sinker in the US from the college board, but it isn't important for them to be successful in college when you, if you take admissions out of it. However, if your school offers AP courses or IB, the International Baccalaureate Program, which I actually prefer that one to AP from a curriculum standpoint, but um, if, if they offer it, 
um, and a student at that school chooses not to take AP courses, and there are some school kids at that school graduating with 15 and up AP courses from high school, then they suffer by comparison. So that doesn't mean that every single student should go in there and try to take the maximum amount of APs because you know, the mental health thing that I'm talking about, and also the, the lots of other other th factors or the time wise, and it's like, what if they're a fantastic athlete? And so um, that is an individual sort of student by student, school by school decision. That is part of what I do when I'm working with students is figuring out that right balance, the special recipe for that student. And um, for some, it means taking all the APs for others, you know, it, it's it, they take three in 10th grade or two in 10th grade and they, you know, really struggle and make C minuses after tutoring and everything else. Well, clearly we don't need to sign up for seven APs in 11th grade, if that's the case. And you have to kind of take it year by year. Um, as far as extracurriculars and how much weight that has, my, my husband likes to joke um, of, well, can you dunk? <laughs> and if you're that kind of athletics, then guess what? You know, if, if Duke wants you to be on their basketball team, then you just have to have the minimum NCAA requirements that you took the right courses and passed them. Um, and they don't, you, you can get in there without so many. But if you're going, let's just to use, I, and I lived so close to Duke for a while and, and also had a good, a good friend who, um, whose daughter rode um, crew there. Basketball at Duke, Football at Alabama, you know, those kinds of things um, can get just about any kid into it as long as they've taken, you know, enough of the maths of the requirements. Um, but if you if it's a lesser known sport, not not a revenue maker, for instance, like women's rowing at Duke, um, my my friend's daughter had to get pretty darn high scores and and take a lot of APs, and even going into senior year, there were. The, they, Duke admissions told her, you need to um, take these courses this year and four weeks into the school year, you need to have straight A's or the deal is off. So that's always, that's, it's a combination. When you hear about people, I wanna warn. So I've worked in two small private schools with tight knit communities and it cracks me up every year because students will, um, I'll, I'll work with a class, they'll go on to college and then the next year, someone will say, well, he got in because he had a perfect score. And I'm like, I know what all the scores are, right? These are, these are private things that I can't say to anyone, but maybe there, someone's claiming, oh, he didn't get in even though he had a, a perfect score. And I know the student did not have anything close to a perfect score. So there's a reason why they didn't get into computer science at the, the university of whatever. So um, the things that you hear, you never know. And sometimes you hear more often of the super top kid that doesn't get in. That mostly has to do with admit rate. But when they don't get into a place that they really should have gotten in, that was more of a safety or a target kind of school for them, um, there are often things that we don't know, like disciplinary issues that came up, getting caught cheating, something like that that's on their record. Um, and those are the kind of things that break my heart because often because that kid felt so much pressure that they decided to plagiarize or cheat on the test or whatever it is. And um, we can't always know, but as far as getting in, we also don't know, you know, is there a grandfather who made a huge financial donation? Um, is there a connection to the trustees of the university? Is there a special talent or just something unusual? And they've built a relationship with um, the admissions rep that has made them get into it. And often the, the conversations that have happen in the bleachers or in the chats or whatever with parents um, don't have a full picture. And I, it was fascinating to me, um, my, at, at the school where I worked um, in Maryland, where I was the director of college counseling, my, my children also attended. So I was, and I'd been like the PTA president way back and like I knew everybody and it was a small town and that that sort of thing. So it, it was always fascinating the stuff that I heard because I knew the reality and it was almost always way off of what happened. And even at my school in Raleigh where I wasn't sort of part of the family community of it, I still would get the same stuff. And I don't know why um, that is, but understand that 
you probably don't have the full picture and that to get into what we're calling the dream, the dream list, almost all of those students have absolute straight A's. Almost all of those students um, have something remarkable that they've pulled off um, in high school. And almost all of them are good communicators and writers um, and have worked really hard in school. That's, uh, and, and so, sometimes they're just people where they haven't had to work hard, but they, um, um, I, I, one of my former students, he just shows up and unfolds his brain and it, he's effortlessly brilliant and he's interested and he, he's, he's curious, he's infinitely curious, which is an academic skill as well. And so without trying and ever doing anything self-consciously, he was the perfect candidate and um, he's in a PhD program at MIT now. He didn't apply to MIT as an undergrad, um, but he um, and he didn't get into every school he applied to, even with all of those things. He was second in his class. If he would tried two days of the year, he'd have been valedictorian, but he was just like, OK, so sometimes it's just you are what you are and you've got a special brain um, for the rest of us that are mere mortals and just good students. Um, it usually takes an awful lot and um, it's it's hard to know. Um, let's see, let me go back to, I think, um, IB students, IB students have disadvantages comparing students taking AP for a college application. Excellent question. The answer is absolutely not. Um, the, there are schools that only do IB, schools that only do IP, uh, AP, some that do neither as the one where I work. Um, and by the way, when we, when we ditched AP, guess what happened? Our SAT and ACT scores went up and even kids, we still gave the test if kids wanted to take it and those went up, funny enough. Um, but IB, so I would say if it, 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 the context of your school is what matters. So if your child goes to a school that doesn't have IB or only has IB or they're in the school and they pick one or the other, um, they're not being compared to a student from my old school where we didn't have either one of those. And a student who goes to a school that has IB isn't being compared to the, the, the high school down the road that only has AP. They're being looked at in the context of the school they attend. This, is, this applies to if they're in a low income area or a rural area where they don't have many of the AP courses and whatnot, they're not gonna hold that against a student um, because, they, because that's their district school. Um, ethically, they say, okay, that, that isn't like, that's in general, what I can, t let me, um, in the state of Maryland where I lived for 16 years, You've got the DC suburbs, some of the Baltimore suburbs that are very dense. DC suburbs public schools are considered often as the top in the nation. Um, excellent. And you have farmland in Maryland as well. For such a tiny state, there's like lots of different types of regions. Um, if you lived in the DC suburbs and you're applying to the University of Maryland, you needed to be um, in the top 20% of your class. And I left, Eight years ago, so this is not this is not accurate current information. I'm giving this as a to illustrate where I lived was rural. If you weren't in the top ten percent of the public schools, you weren't going to get in to the university. They, they weren't going to finish your application because they understood that those high achieving schools were you know these kids are taking their twenty AP classes and that sort of thing was a different animal. And they also had tracked success rates of for a decade of the students coming from a school, how do they perform when they come to that school? So those of you who have kids in super high achieving schools don't say, we should have moved out to the country necessarily. Um, that helps them as well, but there's still that context of the school. So you're not being compared to one or the other. The same thing goes, there are high schools that have both AP and IB. Um, if you choose one track or the other, you're not necessarily, you know, you're not being compared to one or the other you're being more compared to overall rigor of how many of the hard classes did you choose to, to take? And if anything, I've even had a rep talk about, you know, a, the AP students in that school being considered more against the APs, the other AP students versus IB. Overall, AP and IB, IB is thought of as more holistic. There's a lot more writing, um, et cetera. And, oh, 
Yes, sir. I need to circle back to um, uh, 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 let's see to the th question number three. I forgot to answer about working with a counselor of yes. how we do that. M Ms. So, yeah, can yeah. I interrupt one second? A lot of students yeah. are in California, the parents, and you have. I know you made quite a few examples about Maryland and uh, um, where you are right now, but you have so many students <laughs> here. So I think maybe you can reflect on how you help the students in um, California, in New yeah. Jersey and international students. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, I do. I have kids everywhere and overseas. Um, so yes, I've got Massachusetts, um, you name it. Um, but so, so that's so I'm, and I'm also like with my experience of in a state that I knew really well, what I think that that was just as an example of illustration. So the one, the last question about how I work with, with college counseling. So in the ninth grade, um, I would say I typically would talk with, and, and this can vary for students because occasionally a student is applying for a pretty competitive summer program where I might end up talking to them a good bit more. Um, in the winter, but then I might have a student who's doing speech and debate and they already have their extracurricular, their summer program picked and they're going for six weeks to, you know, another to Michigan for a speech and debate camp and where another student might need more. But in general, I would say I talk with my ninth graders. Um, I meet with them at least twice a semester, sometimes three to four, depending on what's needed. We talk about course selection. We talk about extracurriculars. We we do values exercises as well as interest um, surveys. So we're both identifying who they are at their core as well as what are they naturally good at? What do they find interesting? And where might this lead from an academic major pursuit as well as a career pursuit? Um, we talk about extracurriculars. I help kids work through when they're struggling in a class and like the coaching that I was just giving about communicating with your teacher and how to participate more. I question them and they, they hate it when they're not the type to participate in class and I ask about them and, and I will challenge them. Okay, you and I are gonna talk in a month. And when we do, I'm gonna ask you to give me examples of how you participated in class. And so they usually are like, oh, do I really have to raise my hand and not answer a question or ask a question like you really do. And um, the funny thing is once they do it, they're like, it was kind of fun. And then it becomes easier. Um, we, we talk about course registration for each year, right around this time of school year, how to spend their summer. Um, we, in ninth grade, we're often talking about what they're interested in, what they're liking. And I help them cut through to ideally get rid of some extracurriculars if they're doing too many things and they really don't like them. So um, we, we help identify those things. I'm available by text message. We chat with parents um, help anytime. And I often, talk, I often talk with parents more in the earlier high school years. And um, I'm kind of a, um, an ally. And it, I, I think for both students and parents where the parents maybe are worried about something or feeling like their kid's unmotivated. And they might pass me information that the student isn't telling me about um or vice versa that the student will say my mom talks to me about college every single day and it just stresses me out can you talk to her about this and so i do and um like so sometimes it's interference that can help navigate this for everyone um we let's see oh that value the, the i i think of the way that i work is continuing to build each year so we repeat some things the next year and we talk about, okay, let's grade ourselves. How did you do in aligning your activities with your values and your interest? And do we need to cut some dead weight out of your schedule and let you spend more time doing the thing you really love so that you'll go deeper into it? In addition, um, uh, we will start talking a little bit about colleges. Sometimes it depends on the student. Um, I don't like to talk about specific colleges for the reasons that I named earlier before, but maybe late in 10th grade, particularly if a student knows what they really want to study, um, I might start having them do that. I keep a spreadsheet for them. I create it and they keep it really. Um, and throughout 10th and 11th grade, we are, they're, they're looking at, okay, here's a specific school. If sometimes it's not till 11th, again, this is student dependent. 
but I have them look into it and study. Um, okay, what does that academic program really mean? And what what is going, what would I be required to do? And is that interesting to me? In addition, I challenge them to find at least one professor who's doing something really cool and interesting to them. And they take notes on this. That that Google Sheet gets added to the spreadsheet that I use in application season with prospective colleges. I make them research tons about their schools, just how tough it is to get in, um, but also details like, here's what I loved about that school. Do virtual tours or making um, in-person even, and they take notes on this. And then as a senior, when the college says, why do you wanna to apply to our university? Why do you wanna come here? They have things that they've already compiled and it helps them first know themselves better and know the schools better helps them in picking the list of schools where they're really going to apply and then um, be able to convince that college that they know who they are, they know who the college is, and they know why they're a good fit. So um, that's one of the things. Um, junior year, it, it's more intense. By the way, I help with testing, figuring out SAT, ACT, all of that. Um, junior year, it gets a lot more serious. And so I, like I said, ninth grade, like I said, two to four times a semester. I try to do once a month. Um, when it doesn't happen once a month, it is usually that the student has things going on where they're too busy. Um, and we talk more in the summer. So it, it sort of varies um, on that. I, I text very frequently with lots of students and so, and as well as parents. So I'm always available for that. Um, sophomore, it becomes a little more frequent. Junior year, even more, and particularly spring of junior year, it's about every two weeks um, that I'm talking with my, most of my students. Um, sometimes it's very concentrated on summer programs or course registration or testing issues. Other times it's list building and making those assignments on, I want you to look at these five colleges and come back in two weeks and tell me why they're cool or why you don't want to apply there. Um, and then when junior year ends is when some of my students start a little bit before if they have a lighter course load. Most of them are too stressed out and busy in junior year. And as soon as school is out, we start on the application essays, the main personal statement of um, helping them reveal themselves wonderfully to the college through an essay, um, walking them through brainstorming. What are you gonna write about? The topic for every college essay is the student, but we have to find, um, a topic that's going to help them um, reveal themselves to the college in a way that's going to um, be great for them. And so we keep going with um, with that. But I like to have the personal statement is usually about 95% ready to go before school starts. And then um, supplements, short answers and extra things we're doing, we get through a whole lot of those. Um, and depending on if they're away for a summer program or what else is going on depends on how much of it we get done before school starts. Um, but in the, in the beginning of, of um, senior year, I'm in, I'm in contact with my students multiple times a week by text. And we usually have um, a short call. My calls in the summer run longer with them. It gets much shorter because it's go time and they've got to produce in um, the fall. And, but we touch base frequently and it varies by student on like some of them I'm I have a zoom every week um, others it's less um, less so I think does that cover am I like that's a big comprehensive yeah. rambling version I know uh, Miss Santo yeah we uh, as no we have you Miss Pond we have Dr. Montes mm -hmm. quite a few uh, college counselors we have a standard service so and uh so if um, any of you, you are interested, I we have provided all the contact information here. We have everything written. Um, with, it's by grade. Uh, so class of 2025, 24. So we can send you all the information. I'm telling the parents that summarizing what you have um, just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of communication frequency and uh, what we will help. So I know it's really late. I'm just going to show two minutes. Give me two minutes. Sorry. Um, because like all, I always forget um, that we have a partner we work with for the Arctic, um, beautiful Arctic um, summer camp. This is in Chinese, um, Beiji, but in English is here. And it's on Hattie. You can go um, hattie.com or m.hattie.com mobile version of it. You can search Arctic 
And that's the front page for the mobile version. And you can search, you know, here. And there are tons of, you know, educators, everything, information is here. But once you search in Chinese or English, it will pop up. And it's a research uh, cruise trip for I four islands, 22 days. We have about 13 to 15 professors, six research areas, and uh, we'll take your students. And the medium um, cabin cost per student or parent is welcome to join. It's about 8,200 US dollars. It's very reasonable as food, everything's paid except for airline tickets, okay? And we do have some deadlines that we have to meet. And uh, we have about 100, 120 students and parents going in and 80 um, staff, professors, um, chaperones are going. So hopefully, I know a lot of you guys are waiting for Cosmo uh, summer programs. You know, Ms. Anton's helping, you know, some students applying just some, you know, official summer programs. But, you know, whatever, if you decide to join us, I think your kid's going to have a lot of fun. And I'm going there myself as well, flying from the U.S. And all the kids in China will be flying out of Beijing. So it's very well organized. The, um, the company, the cruise ship is Ocean Atlantic. We have insurance, medical insurance. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful, all I can say. So we have this uh, YouTube that recorded event in Chinese, and we're going to host an English event so your students can come and take a look at it. Uh, age 10, you can go by yourself. We're going to take you, but if you want to join, yeah, please feel free. And um, English menu, Chinese menu, all there. Um, even though some kids that I, I want to study art, photography, it's just the, I think it's very unique um, setting for your students even to learn arts and draw polo bears, you know, go on and on. We have separate events for the parents, separate events for the kids. And some parents care about the research, which I care as well. I think the research not only helping if you wanna study science, it will help with all areas. I was an English major, research skills very important for me as well. So it, the basic research kids can learn to establish hypothesis, how to um, collect the data, how to use the data to analyze the hypothesis, is correct or wrong, that can be applied to for all areas, social science, humanities, STEM majors, et cetera, okay? So, and if you guys are interested, we have, you, most of your heady um, parents and students can WeChat us, email us, and phone us, and text us, okay? So, and that's about it. And it's about 10.30. Um, I want to really emphasize Ms. Anton is in East Coast, um, but she is working with, name the high school here, Del Norte, <laughs> Canyon Crest in San Diego. And uh, she has all students and Torrey Pines, Pacific Ridge, um, and Bishop students are meeting with you as well. And also Northern California, Vancouver, Asia, New Jersey, quite a few students, maybe in Arizona last year, a student went to um, UC LA, some students got into UC Berkeley. So, and this year, Ms. Anton helped the twins, the twins in one large public school in California and get into early decision in a top, top major art school, Rhode Island School of Design, and also Tisch um, um, College. Of, of NYU, and also your student got into uh, Northwestern for early decision. So, um, however, we are very few um, um, the platforms and companies. We do not select students, okay? Uh, we do not say, hey, we want to work with you because you're Ivy League material. We work with mm -hmm. all students. Our service from Ms. Ento and all our counselors from the company from teachers, we have 100,000 teachers in our database. We service all students, regardless of your level, okay? That's what I want to make very clear. But we do really want to work with the students, and we want to empower them, Ms. Anton said, initiatives. So if the parents are too concerned and want to join every single Zoom call and really just, you know, kind of join the students for this process very intimately, sometimes a little bit challenging because we wanna leave the students some rooms. So you'll feel free to talk to Ms. Anton, our counselors, but we wanna have some room
for the student's privacy. All your students' information with us is confidential. We do not share major stats. A lot of companies say, hey, I got the students in, this is the SAT, this, this. I share my own kids, okay? And unless the students are willing to share, and this, you know, you can dig out some YouTubers and they're wonderful students, they wanna share their data, that's completely fine. But we do not put in any writing that we got a student in Stanford, that's their stats, one, two, three. It's very, very misleading, okay? I created myself some misleading posts on Chinese Instagram, Xiao Hongshu, talking about my kid 11B, and it caught a lot of traffic, but maybe that's because of my marketing material. But I told the, everybody very clearly, the kid, two hobbies, cooking and teaching, and also he writes really well. So anyway, I'm not getting to the specific case, and it's really late. So I think we would ramp up here. Ms. Anton, it's 10.30 your time. Thank yeah. you so much. Anything you want to tell our parents um, at the end as a summary? Um, I think the biggest thing is don't worry, it'll all be okay. <laughs> that that uh that any any student who wants to go to college and be successful at it can do that and um uh, keep loving on your kids. And um there's not many years left when they're in your house. Um, so have fun, you know, laugh together, sing together. And um, I, I think that helps so much when everyone's feeling okay um, as well. And, but, but um, I, I love teenagers, they're great. And, you know, they're not always great, I know. But so um, find, find the joy um, with your family in addition to keeping everyone on track. Thank you, Ms. Anton. Yes. Thank you so thank much. You, Ms. Anton. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all the support, all the parents. Thank you. Well. Yeah, thank you. great group. Thank Mm, thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night, Miss Anton. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.